Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, let me welcome all of you to this uh, webinar uh, jointly organized by Institute of Chinese Studies and Gateway House, Mumbai. Uh, I would like to especially thank uh, Manjit Kriplani, Executive Director, Gateway House, uh, for joining us in organizing this uh, Wednesday seminar. Uh, she's with us uh, this evening. Uh, we also had the print as a media partner for this event. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Ms. Jyoti Malhotra, National Strategic Affairs Editor of the Print. We are live streaming the webinar on the YouTube channel and a whole lot of people are following it on YouTube along with uh, participation of uh, lots of friends uh, in, the Z in the Zoom meeting room. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our speaker, Ambassador Lieutenant General Carl Eikenberry. Uh, Carl is joining us from California, where it's 5.30 in the morning. So we really appreciate it that you have agreed to join us and speak on a fascinating theme, which is of interest to a whole lot of us. As you know, Ambassador Eikenberry has excelled in multiple careers in diplomacy, military service, and academia. He served as the US Ambassador to Afghanistan from 2009 until 2011, and as a defense attache, at the US Embassy in Beijing. He had a 35 year long distinguished career in the US Army and retired as Lieutenant General in 2009. He held key policy and staff positions at NATO Pacific Command in the USA and in China. He has an impressive resume as an academic associated with various leading universities and think tanks. He's a well-known Chinese scholar with multiple degrees in East Asian and Chinese studies. He's currently holding a faculty position at Swartzman College of Tsinghua University, China's premier university. Welcome, Carl. And thanks again for joining us so early in the morning. We're delighted, that, we are delighted that Ambassador will be speaking today on the growing military rivalry between China and the USA. It's rivalry which is unfolding as part of a much larger strategic and geopolitical competition between China and the USA. It's manifesting at a time when there's a tussle for preeminence between the two countries in the Indo-Pacific and globally. And the Chinese military is expanding its footprint and global capabilities in a systematic manner. We're dealing with an aggressive PLA along our own borders, as you know. There's also an increasingly risky face-off between the Chinese and US navies in the Western Pacific in hotspots of South China Sea and Taiwan Strait. Carl will discuss the state of US-China military rivalry and the factors that will shape its future course. Ambassador Eikenberry will speak for about 25, 30 minutes and has kindly agreed to take questions after that. You may indicate your interest in asking questions by using the raise hand option Questions can also be put to me through the chat option. I'll call on participants to ask their questions. The concerned participants will unmute himself or herself. Other participants are requested to keep themselves muted. And now it gives me great pleasure inviting Ambassador Lieutenant General Carl Eichenberry to make his remarks. Over to you, Carl. Ambassador Manjit, thank you very much. Um, if you would allow me a moment here, I'm going to try to uh, go up with my slides and And can you tell me if uh, you're seeing the uh, slides? Yes, we are. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. And can you put it on slideshow? That's what I'm doing right now, Ambassador. And it's, uh... There we go. Yeah, good. You have those up now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So, let me start, uh, first of all, with some 
sincere words of uh, respect or shout outs as I guess the popular expression of the day is first uh, to you, Manjin, the Gateway House. Uh, you know, you're the co-founder of Gateway House going back to 2009 and uh, the executive director. And I wanted to let you and your, uh, your audience here know that uh, your fellows, your analysts, your staff have really done an extraordinary job of contributing to the world's better understanding of uh, all the cutting edge global issues. And I'll give one specific example for all to uh, hear your participation, you and you, one of your analysts, participation in the Stanford University hosted conference earlier this year on the PRC's uh, Belt Road Initiative. And I have to say that Gateway House was the uh, rock star of that session. And then for you, Ambassador, and your Institute of Chinese Studies, Delhi, with its history going back to 1969, which by the way, uh, by chance, is my freshman year at the United States Military Academy at West Point when I began first studying Mandarin Chinese. And two points about ICS, but here's, albeit speaking as an American. First, India and the United States really have huge overlapping common interests in better understanding China and developing effective policies and strategies to ensure stability and uh, hopefully more convergence. And ICS provides a really wonderful bridge. And then second, the expertise your team brings to the table, I have to say is not available in Washington, Berlin, Canberra, Tokyo, anywhere else. And the world can learn a great deal by spending time with ICS. So as you said, the uh, topic is growing Sino-American military rivalry. And it's a topic which is relevant not only to civilian and military leaders in Beijing and Washington, but I would argue, and I know all of you understand, and we'll explore during, uh, during today's talk, that this is a topic relevant in capitals around the world, especially in Delhi, as tragic events uh, this past summer made uh, very clear. So let's see now if I can advance the slides and I can, great. So here's what we're going to, uh, here's how we're gonna proceed. As the ambassador said, some initial prepared remarks by myself and then look forward to a conversation ambassador with you and Manjeet and uh, very much hoping that we draw upon your expertise and then to an open discussion. Now for my prepared remarks, what I'd like to do is cover these three topics. So historical context and focusing on the factors that help explain the rise of US-China security competition over the past three decades. Then I'd like to identify some of the drivers of this growing military rivalry. And then third, perhaps most interesting, explore the issues that are making managing this competition so difficult or to say it another way, the challenges both sides are having in establishing credible deterrence. What I'm really hoping is that these opening remarks though will serve as a kind of food for thought and help stimulate a, a good discussion. Some themes I'd like to uh, lay out for all of us uh, before I begin that we'll see throughout my remarks and I think we'll touch upon during our subsequent conversation. First of all, there is a significant chance in the current environment for an accident or a miscalculation at the tactical level in the Western Pacific between the operational forces of the United States and the People's Republic of China. And a tactical kind of mishap, of course, would have huge strategic consequences. The second is that military doctrines around the world, of all the great powers, but especially the United States and China, military doctrines and strategies are in flux. And this complicates efforts hugely to exercise mutual restraint. And as I mentioned before, to achieve credible deterrence. And then the third point is that the security dilemmas are increasing, or as I'll talk about in just a moment, defense dilemmas. I think most of you are aware that Professor Robert Jervis at Columbia University uh, talk long ago about the security dilemma, a situation in which actions taken by a state to increase its own security cause reactions from other states, which in turn lead to a decrease rather than an increase in the original state's security. So let's with that then start with the historical context. And this is an era 
uh, talk about the th uh, last three decades, but before, this is an area that I witnessed from the classroom at uh, West Point as a student of Chinese. Uh, my time in Hong Kong studying Chinese at the, at the uh, United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense Chinese Language School, and then on at Nanjing University in 1982 and 83. But then as a player in all of this in 1985 as an assistant army attache in the US embassy in Beijing and uh, beyond as a defense attache in the late 1990s. It's really mind boggling to think of the changes that have occurred over this period of time. You know, firsthand in the mid 1980s when I was an assistant army attache at our embassy in Beijing, the United States, remember it's a cold war and we have an alignment with China uh, against the uh, Soviet Union. And during this period of time, we have foreign military and foreign military sales and commercial sales programs where we're selling the PLA, what we call the Firefinder radar, which they in turn use in their border war with Vietnam. And we're selling Black Hawk helicopters as a young army attache, I remember witnessing on a trip to Alassa in Tibet, uh, PLA Black Hawk helicopters landing. A starting point when we talk then about the historical context is the very rapid growth of PRC military spending and power. And of course, this is derivative from the PRC's rapid economic rise. So just a visual here, show the comparisons of from 1996, when the US is spending 16 times as much as China on our defense, uh, on our armed forces, by 2006, that's down to seven times. 2018, it's three times. And now it's about 2.5, 2.6 in this year, probably with China's defense budget being understated. It's useful to look at the growth of Chinese military spending over time and look at three different periods. And this can help us better understand then the drivers of US and China military competition. Let me see if I can take this. I'm getting a, a effect on the slides here. Let me see the next slide if that comes off. Um, so let's look at this slide. On the y-axis, you see spending in US dollars in trillions. And then on the x-axis, you see the period of time from 1990, uh, then going out into the future. You see, first of all, from 1990 to about 3,000, and this compares US uh, military spending and Chinese military spending with the blue at the top, mostly on the top, the US. 1990 to 2000, it's flatlined for the US and interestingly for China. China's got double digit economic growth going from the late 1970s through 2000. And why is it that their military spending is flatlined? Then the period 2000 to about present where you'll see a dramatic increase in Chinese military spending, US military spending also increasing, but very much explained by the global, so-called global war on terror, and then comes back down, then we'll speculate on the future. So we'll start then with this first period of time, the 1990s. And I'd like to make several points. First of all, again, I've get, I apologize for this uh, markup that's a, uh, occurring on the slides. Um, the first period of time, the 1990s, why is China not investing a lot in defense during this period of time? Well, it's part of their overall economic modernization strategy. A much lower accord is being afforded, uh, given to the military, emphasis by Chinese leaders on industry, agriculture, and developing their S&T base. So this is a deliberate choice they're making to limit defense spending at the time. Second, the international environment in the 1990s, uh, the Chinese would say is extremely favorable. Uh, US-China military relations are generally positive, save with a few exceptions that I'll mention. 
and very much like the United States finding itself in an environment after the collapse of the Soviet Union where they have no evident strategic adversary, so it is with China. But at the same time in the 1990s, there's inflection points where CCP or Communist Chinese Party leaders and PLA leaders are becoming increasingly aware of just how far the US was ahead in terms of military capabilities and its enabling doctrine. So there was the stunning US-led coalition victory during the liberation of Kuwait in 1991. PLA experts and many around the world predicted that the United States would suffer tens of thousands of battle deaths. As it turned out, the United States suffered 219. So a kind of wake up call. Then secondly, two embarrassing and indeed humiliating incidents for China in the later 1990s. First, the Taiwan Strait crisis, when the PLA conducted provocative missile firing exercises in the run-up to Taiwan's 1996 presidential election. And two US carrier battle groups were sent as a show of force by the United States and the PLA having no adequate response capability. And then secondly, an event that I witnessed firsthand is the defense attache in Beijing was NATO's and the US accidental bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999 and ordinance hitting the embassy and hitting the PLA attache office precisely all by mistake. It elicited a very ex uh, excited nationalistic response in China, understandably. And this leads then to a political military consensus in China that it needed to embark on a path of rapid defense modernization. Second period of time now when China's defense spending does start to uh, increase and goes into double digit growth. Several important factors during this period of time. Number one, that the United States is strategically distracted and we're distracted in Iraq and we're distracted in Afghanistan with our military focused on wars of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. And so our eye is off the ball, so to speak. Some say a kind of strategic street, uh, sleepwalking and our eye is off great power competition. Secondly, during this period of time, uh, even before Xi Jinping under Hu Jintao, but accelerating under Xi Jinping, huge investments in the PLA and their capabilities and capacity start to grow. The third point is their economic footprint is expanding globally and behind those expanding global interests then is a military rising and then as capabilities evolve, military interest develop in defense of the economic interest. So there you see on the bottom left-hand corner, a photograph taken from the Chinese non-combatant evacuation operation in Aden where they rescued or re, uh, were able to evacuate 600 PRC and 225 foreign citizens or in the middle at the bottom, the growth of their artificial islands in the South China Sea as they begin to assert more control in the Western Pacific and to begin to develop a much more assertive foreign policy. And then finally, I mentioned the security dilemma before. This starts to become very evident in late 2011. You'll recall at that time, President Obama in Canberra, Australia announces the so-called pivot to uh, Asia. Chinese, the PLA immediately characterized this as a containment strategy. So a US move, which was looked at as simply responding to China's increasing assertiveness is interpreted in Beijing as a containment strategy. And then last, talking about the future, um, point number one, here on the left-hand side is the United States uh, so-called strategic approach to the People's Republic of China. This is a Trump administration uh, release of our strategy with regard to China. This was, in turn, a response to a congressionally uh, mandated requirement to the executive branch that they produce such a document. But this 
uh, really is just a reflection of what was already evident in 1997 with the Trump administration's first national security strategy in early 1998 with its first national defense strategy. And the point of the strategy is that we've now entered an era of state competition. It is the previous focus on transnational threats, especially terrorism, given a much lower priority and China and Russia are listed as the primary security and military threats to the United States, as shown here. Uh, an interesting document to look through if uh, you have the uh, interest in time available as it shows online, but uh, quotes such as China, Beijing's military buildup threatens the United States and allied national security interest and poses complex challenges for global commerce and supply chains. I put this up here, even though we have an election coming up on the 3rd of November, and perhaps Ambassador Manjit, you'd like to talk about what the consequences of this might be for the United States defense strategy. But by and large, uh, you have bipartisan support, both Republican and Democratic support uh, for the Trump administration's general strategy, the tactics that they're using, great disagreements. But I don't think uh, the Biden administration would have great differences with this document shown here on the left. Second is we look into the future challenges though in anticipating how US and China's defense strategies will emerge. Two problems here. The first is the uncertainty of the rise of Chinese economic power. And then from that, of course, Chinese military power and questions about the United States and what does its future growth rate look like? So here's one estimate uh, by the year 2024 that China's GDP in terms of purchasing power parity would be at about $35 trillion, the United States at 25 trillion. But what most people and planners in the United States assume is that China's economy will continue to have higher growth rates over the next 10 to 15 years in the United States. And then you have to, from that, make your judgments about what will be the impact on military modernization. Final point about the future is also the uncertainty about Chinese science and technology achievements and how those translate into precise capabilities for the Chinese military. And I'll talk about those in just a moment. Let's talk now about sources of military rivalry. And I have three that we'll focus on. The first is United States vital interest in the Western Pacific and China's vital interest in the Western Pacific. Militaries would, cause, uh, would call this then more military operational concerns. The second is the increasing competition between the United States and China, which the ambassador teed up in his opening remarks or his introduction, the increasing competition for global access and influence. And then third, the battle for, as we say, the occupation of the technological commanding heights. So these in turn then, first of all, vital interest in the Western Pacific. China's land borders with the critical and very important distinction of, China, of India have mostly been defined now and agreed upon with neighbors. And I emphasize and foot stomp uh, the exception being India. And again, the reminder this summer of how important that exception is. But then turning to the maritime frontier, the maritime frontier from a Chinese perspective has not yet been defined and agreed upon with neighbors. The Western Pacific shown here with that uh, brown uh, ellipse is absolutely critical to China for its commercial trade. And they also have major sovereignty issues, expansive claims in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, and also with regard to Taiwan. So for the PRC, 
in the Western Pacific. It's about maritime access. It is a strategic security issue, and it's about sovereignty. For the United States, it's about freedom of navigation, which has huge global precedence. And it's also about credibility. And what do I mean about credibility? We have two treaty allies that are involved in these maritime disputes, Japan and the Republic of the Philippines, and there's also Taiwan. Now, for US military planners, the operational problems then that are faced in the Western Pacific are getting more difficult to effectively address. Number one, the steam time, that is the amount of time taken for a, a naval ship to get for, to go from a base of operations and get to the South China Sea, the steam time uh, is considerable relative to that of the Chinese Navy. So if you can look closely at that slide, you'll see if we have US naval ships leaving from San Diego in a crisis to get to the South China Sea, that's 13 to 21 days. Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, 10 to 16 days. Seventh Fleet headquarters at Yokosuka, Japan, 1,700 miles. Guam, a very important base, about three to five days of steam time. And Okinawa, two to three days of steam time. Australia, 19, uh, about 1,900 miles of distance. For the PLA Navy, they are already present in the South China Sea. Those artificial islands that I talked about can be very quickly converted into a base of operations. And even their base in uh, Sanya and Hainan is about 12 hours of steam time to the point of crises. So time distance factors as China becomes more cap capable and has more assets to put into the South China Sea and the East China Sea works against the United States. Secondly, is the vulnerability of US space and land-based communications and logistics bases. Single points of failure, so to speak, with one big air base in Tokyo, in uh, Japan at Kadena, in Okinawa, a big single air base in Guam at Anderson, a single air base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and so forth. So single points of failure in terms of communication systems and logistics and the US during these wars of against terrorism and the wars of counterinsurgency that they were fighting. Uh, the United States, I would say our military got a bit lazy. So taking for granted then that all of our assets, whether they're in space or in land could not be contested by an opposing force, but China's come some distance now in developing capabilities that can threaten our space-based communications and intelligence systems. So the United States is responding to this by trying to build more resilience. And then third is the increasing threat that PLA forces pose to US power projection platforms, especially US Navy carrier battle groups. And the ability of the PLA, its Air Force and its Navy and its rocket forces to threaten those kind of strike carrier groups leads the US then to have to stay at further distance from the area of operation, which then of course degrades its capabilities as the fighter aircraft and strike aircraft based upon that carrier now are farther from the point of conflict and uh, have to fly further and can have less, much less loiter time in the area. A final point I'd like to make about the Western Pacific and one of the themes I talked about up front in my uh, initial remarks, and that is the risk of an accident in the South China Sea between the operational forces of China and the US. So I've got on that star there in the South China Sea a point which is close to one of the atolls called Johnson, uh, Johnson Reef. And on October the 1st, ironically, October the 1st is National Day in China. October the 1st, two years ago, a little over two years ago, USS Decatur, an early Burke destroyer shown on the left, got within 45 meters of 
colliding with the PLA Navy Luyang II destroyer shown there on the right. The Luyang II destroyer as, this, as the USS Decatur was conducting a freedom of naviga navigation operation first Decatur off course. And uh, we were very, very close to having a very serious incident in the South China Sea. Just to give you an idea of what 40, 45 meters looks like, there's a uh, soccer or a football pitch and there's the red arrow shows uh, what 40 yards look like or 40 meters look like on that pitch. Once again, if we should have two of our aircraft collide or two of our naval vessels collide and say two destroyers uh, entangle, uh, that would immediately lead to perhaps 10 US, 10 Chinese sailors dead, uh, dozens wounded, thrown overboard, search and rescue operations uh, quickly begin. China perhaps saying that permission needed for the United States to conduct search and rescue because it's Chinese sovereign space. And you can speculate then on how serious things might get very quickly. Now more briefly, Beyond the Western Pacific, second driver of competition is competition for global access and presence. The competition has been increased between China and the United States has been increasing globally. It's primarily diplomatic and economic, but there's been growing emphasis on both sides about the implications of potential military access and presence. This is played out with the Belt Road Initiative and the US response. Many US responses primarily have been economic and diplomatic to this point, but with the Pentagon thinking more about it. Uh, here's an example of the United States under the Trump administration uh, established the US International Development Finance Corporation uh, can give loans on generous terms and grants to developing countries, uh, often for the development of infrastructure. Uh, this was very much developed in response to BRI. And then both sides in the search for allies or strategic partners. China, as you're uh, well aware of with Russia, uh, beginning to uh, explore strategic cooperation agreements with other uh, countries, hard to uh, hard to determine if there's much behind it, but even a discussion with Iran ongoing about a strategic relationship. And then the United States on our part uh, in the Indo-Pacific region with aspirations of developing uh, trilateral, quadrilateral kind of groupings uh, in order then to densen, uh, to make more dense our set of partnerships and allies within the region and thinking about hedging against China. Uh, all of you aware about the Quad grouping of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India with a security uh, dimension to this. Uh, I know that uh, most recently there was the announcement that Australia will join the Malabar uh, Naval uh, exercise, training exercise, uh, which then would include Australia, the United States, India, and Japan. And clearly, Chinese aggressive behavior is giving US efforts a shot in the arm. Even NATO is now discussing challenges posed by the PRC, and we can discuss this later if you'd like. Finally, the third area of competition or driver of competition is the imperatives of technological advantage leading to perhaps a tendency to decouple. I know that uh, all of you are well familiar that both the China and the United States are increasingly playing both offense and defense when it comes to trying to maintain or acquire lead in critical areas of technology. So, China has embarked upon what they call the civil military fusion program. And that's a program where gains that are made in the civilian sector are transferable seamlessly to the military. And this is something that the United States thinks a lot about as well, of course, that if we were to go back to the 1970s, 
and asked the question at that time, how much of what the United States military would consider important military technologies was coming from first from the commercial sector and being transferred over, the answer would be perhaps about 20, 25%. Most of the technologies, the cutting edge defense technologies that mattered at that time were coming out of the defense industry sector, proprietary contracts from the United States government. Now, if you'd ask in the Pentagon, what percentage of technologies that matter are coming out of the civilian sector? The answer would be about 80%. So this is flipped. So when China talks about civil military fusion, so does the United States. This complicates then efforts hugely to try to uh, develop economic exchange agreements with regard to trade and investment because an increasing number of technologies and commercial firms are producing technologies and products that do have defense implications. We talked about offense and defense. Offense, example being Uh, 5G, where uh, regardless of what the Trump administration is saying, it's on the offense right now, and it's trying to clip the wings of Huawei and Chinese competitors that are out in front of the United States in some ways with regard to 5G telecommunications. And then also playing defense, protecting our key technologies by a really dizzying array of export control regimes that we've established over the last three to four years and building higher fences around our research and development crown jewels. And lastly, secure supply chains. This is a question uh, issue that existed before the onset of the pandemic. It's accelerated since the pandemic. And whether you're in the United States, whether you're in China, For that matter, whether you're, I think, in Delhi or London or Berlin, everyone's talking about secure supply chains. This has tremendous implications for U.S. and China military competition. Let me end with briefly talking about some of the challenges then to deterrence. Why is it that both sides know that unconstrained military competition would be dangerous and pose significant economic opportunity costs, and yet it's so difficult to manage this competition. Four challenges. First of all, uncertain scenarios and red lines, so to speak. There's tactical scenarios such as the one we think a lot about, South China Sea, but I could see many, uh, East China Sea, I could see one with Taiwan, where it begins as a tactical scenario, but there's no clear escalation uh, control or off-ramp strategy that's been thought through and available. And I think there's an underappreciation in Washington and Beijing to the degree to which the opposite side understands uh, if it recognizes the vital interest of the other side. So does the United States fully appreciate the degree to which China is looking at the South China Sea as a Chinese lake? Is it really understood in Beijing that the United States cannot abide a precedent in which the South China Sea becomes a Chinese lake? This is especially true in the uh, Western Pacific. Uh, and You've got a combustible mix of strategic logic with a nationalist fervor over what are being categorized as sovereignty issues. Second is the glowing complexity of warfare. Talked about the expansion of technologies into the commercial sector. There's new domains now of warfare that are emerging in space, in cyber, unmanned vehicles. The boundaries of warfare are blurring so-called gray zone operations. You have offense advantages that obtain from some of these technologies like cyber, where the advantage goes to the first strike. Uh, These are destabilizing. And it's not clear how all of these technologies and other systems that are being developed, how they should be employed militarily. 
it's difficult to have any uh, certainty then which is needed for deterrence to be effective. The third is the security dilemma, but let me frame it here since we're talking about military competition is the defense planners dilemma. So with the lead time that's required for the development of military hardware, this feeds into the security dilemma. But at the point, if the United States then develops say an undersea warfare capability, and this is going to be developed with a degree of transparency as our Congress needs to approve the funding, there's going to be a long development program and a testing program and a fielding and a training program. So we might announce the intent to develop a certain capability, which we look at as warranted to respond to China's increasing aggressiveness and capabilities, but we won't see that capability for 10, 12, 13 years. China, they look then at this capability the United States is developing and their view is we're entirely defensive, we're responding to an American provocation. And so their Pentagon equivalent goes and says, we need to develop a kind of offset. And so the arms spiral uh, uh, continues. And then third, uh, the, the final point would be then the limit of bilateral military relations. And what do I mean by that? that there's a tendency in capitals, at least and just talk to each other. There is a role for militaries to be talking to each other in this environment. It's, they should be talking about accident avoidance, crises management. They should have talks about uh, doctrine because doctrine makes, can help understand better intent but there's a limit to what militaries can accomplish. At the end of the day, the PLA is a professional military. It's under Communist Party Xi Jinping control. The United States has got a professional military and we're constitutionally under the control of our civilian leaders. Militaries get paid to look at the glass as half empty. They get paid to develop insurance policies if diplomacy fails. And so regardless of military dialogues that are going on between China and the United States, at the end of the day, what is truly important is the civilian diplomatic decisions that are made that the military then in turn support. Let me stop there, spoke a little bit too long, but let me see what I can do here on the screen and Okay, Thank I you. should have... Okay. Yeah, you are back. You're back on the screen. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much for that uh, brilliant exposition on uh, growing uh, military rivalry between China and the USA. You were lucid, you were insightful, and what you said is extremely relevant for us, more so at this point of time, when uh, we are at the saving end of PLA's uh, belligerence uh, along our land borders with China. You, in a, in a uh, brief but uh, succinct manner, uh, brought out the history of uh, military rivalry between uh, the USA and China, identified drivers of competition, and discussed uh, challenges to deterrence. Uh, uh, some of the facts and figures you brought out are truly revealing, you know, like what you mentioned about uh, uh, you know, rapid defense modernization of China, uh, China's uh, uh, dramatic increase in China's military spending, the ratio you gave that in 1996, uh, USA was spending uh, uh, 18 times as much as China on defense. And these defense spending numbers in China understated, as you mentioned, that ratio has come down to 2.6 now. So it's truly, you know, it's a huge uh, increase which has taken place. In India, in fact, uh, if you go by CIPRI numbers, uh, last year, China's defense budget was four times as much as India's defense budget, you know. So it has own, its own implications for us. Uh, you also brought out what you discussed, described as the shadow of the future, uh, challenges posed by China's 
military build up uh, sources of uh, military rivalry between china and the usa drivers of competition and finally uh, you know finally challenges to deterrence uh, uh, between china and the us so thank you very much for that presentation as we discussed earlier the next uh, part of our webinar uh, we will have a brief conversation with you uh, manjit and i will pose some questions to you uh, let me begin with something which you alluded to but didn't quite uh, develop uh, now this is upcoming uh, presidential elections in the usa which are you know less than two weeks away uh, you mentioned that uh, president trump's china policy has bipartisan support Uh, though there are you no know, of course differences on on uh, details and tactics uh, what kind of differences in the security and defense strategies uh, uh, do you envisage uh, between a trump and biden administration i am not trying to speculate on what will happen on third number in the usa but if there is change in administration what kind of major differences or changes do you envisage yeah in if i could i'm going to put up the uh my uh, photo i'm having a bit of a camera problem here and i'll see if i can get it back um so uh, ambassador on the question of what a biden administration trump administration defense uh, policy would be with especially with respect to china if i could first though uh just make clear how much bipartisan support there is uh for the general direction of the Trump administration with respect to China at least saying that uh, perhaps the Trump administration is the one that sounded the uh, toxin um uh, first within the executive branch the i had talked very briefly in the world of economic exchange and technology competition the sweeping uh sets of rules regulations that have been put in place uh, and they go as well into law enforcement so you have now three and a half years almost four years into the trump administration if you go into the department of defense of course they have their sets of rules and regulations that didn't exist with regard to exchange with china the department of state the department of commerce the department of treasury the federal bureau of investigation so even if you had a biden administration that came in that said we really want to have a major change quickly and and uh, go in a very different direction which you will not it would be very difficult for them to do second point is that of course the trump administration wasn't acting on its own many times what gets reported as the trump administration has rolled out this new policy was in fact in response to a congressional act or congressional mandate i think you all would find this interesting if you look at congressional us congressional legislation that names china now this could be resolutions or bills we're currently in the what we call the 116th congress of the united states 2019 to January of next year we aren't done yet there were 567 resolutions and bills introduced in this congress in two years that names china to give you, to put that number in some kind of context 567 in one in the 107th congress 2001 to 2003 the first years of the so called global war on terror 135 So 135 now we're at 567. Some of the resolutions and bills. Uh there's the South China Sea and East China Sea Sanctions Act of 2019. There's the Fair Trade with China Enforcement Act. There's Preventing China from Explo- Exploiting COVID-19 Act. The Countering the Chinese Government and Communist Party's Political Influence Operations Act. A resolution condemning the persecution of Christians in China. and uh brace yourself for this one a bill to prohibit the use of federal funds for purchasing dogs and cats from wet markets in China and for other purposes um and if you go into the polling whether it's republican or democrat 
you get the same result. A lot of bipartisan actions going on in Congress, the only bipartisan actions with regard to China policy. And the last point is, is this an elite issue in Washington, D.C., as often foreign policy issues can be? The answer is no. Pew survey, uh, our Pew uh, surveys are conducted in the United States and around the world and a pretty good barometer of U.S. opinion at least. The unfavorable views of China in the year 2005 in the United States was 35%. 35 percent. 35 percent of Americans polled in 2005 had an unfavorable view of China. In this year of 2020, 73 percent. But also, let me point out that this isn't just the United States that has seen this trend. That same comparison, about 2005 to 2020, unfavorable views. Australia, 40 to 81 percent. Japan, 42 to 86 percent. Korea, 24 to 75 percent. Germany, 25 to 71 percent. And get this again, brace yourself. Even Sweden is angry, 14 percent to 85 percent. Now, to get to though to the question of how would we, what policies would we see change? Um, I think that under uh, Biden administration, we'll see less defense spending, but with regard to China, that probably won't matter. I think there'll be a tendency to, under Biden administration, to try to draw down as the Obama administration tried to do, and truly the Trump administration tried to do, is to draw down in the Middle East and Central Asia. Uh, uncertain what they'll do in Europe because of concerns with Russia, but a more doubling down in the Western Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific area. What you'll see from a Biden administration that would be quite different from a Trump administration. First of all, much more emphasis on allies and partners. Now, I think that the Trump administration has gotten too much criticism in the Indo-Pacific area for uh, disunity or uh, not linking economic and security policies. Uh, I think that that uh, guilty is charged in Europe to some extent in Asia, but perhaps the argument is overstated. Regardless, globally, you'll see a Biden administration which tries to uh, reinforce and reinvigorate alliances and partnerships and will better synchronize economic and security policies. So as an example, not going after a key ally, which we look at is very important in creating a more united front with regard to China, not going after them separately in a, a, some kind of trade war. You'll also see with the Biden administration, a return to a much more transparent and coherent bureaucratic process. And I think in a good way. Um, in Washington, DC, I think most would agree right now that our national security decision-making process is a bit incoherent and unpredictable and subject to uh, daily tweets. I think that uh, finally, you'll see from a Biden administration an effort being made to uh, see if there's areas that China and the United States can possibly cooperate in. So uh, perhaps in uh, fighting uh, pandemic threats, uh, certainly in the area of climate change, but very but being very clear eyed. And the term that's developed under the Trump administration of China as a strategic competitor, the Biden administration will uh, continue that. And I think Ambassador, you're uh, need to unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Ambassador? Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. You're audible, okay. yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that very thoughtful response. Uh, I have many more questions, but I'll limit myself to one more question because I can see a whole lot of people who'd like to ask questions in the chat box. Uh, you know, you referred to risk of accident at tactical level with huge implications. And you gave the example of what can happen in South China Sea. Another theater where there is that risk is Taiwan Strait. Uh, 
would like to you know uh, tell us something about the risks and consequences of conflict between China and the USA and Taiwan Strait. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll try to be a briefer with my uh, answers here. I I did think it was important though to um, just share with you my own perspectives on the upcoming. Uh, election and the future of no that was extremely China. useful thank you thank you very much for doing that so um ambassador yeah, please, with regard yeah. to the south china sea uh the kind of scenario that uh i worry about and i know that i, I stay in touch with uh our active duty military and formally some of them uh, that uh, i've served with that uh let me play out a scenario which I started to talk about during my prepared remarks. So that a US destroyer and a Chinese destroyer collide. Now, if I were China, my next step would be to be thinking about how to control escalation. So what I'm going to do is I'll jump out front and I will immediately, my playbook would be, I tell the world that the United States, despite a repeated warning, had this provocation uh, where their uh, failure of navigation uh, led to them ramming, uh, perhaps intentionally as they characterize it, a, a PLA destroyer. China in their goodness though, uh, is conducting search and rescue operations uh, in their territorial waters, and that uh, they very quickly pick up a couple of U.S. sailors. They show them to the uh, world how well they're being cared for. And then the PLA immediately announces that uh, the search and rescue operations must be coordinated through China because this is their territorial waters. And only with their permission will U.S. Uh, rescue assets and surveillance assets be allowed in. I would also at the same time say that because of this provocation, China defensively now is against its will, but now being forced to deploy military assets into those artificial islands. So I'd deploy a couple of squadrons of fighters. I'd move naval assets there and say, you know, we really didn't want to militarize this, but the United States has now forced us to. So I may be, uh, uh, if we had a PLA uh, uh, expert, or if we had a PLA officer in this conference right now or a diplomat, they might uh, disagree sharply. But that's how, if I was in the Pentagon, I'd war game this. Now, what does the United States do is our next step. Um, if we really believe that China is going to uh, deny us search and rescue operations, well, the first thing you want to do is uh, take care of the sailors who are injured? And is it worth getting into a uh, tactical conflict in order to assert that principle of your right under international law to conduct search and rescue operations? And so it goes. I, I worry, Ambassador, that uh, we've got the freedom of navigation operations going on in the South China Sea, uh, a chance that we'll really have an accident but I don't know that either side has thought through escalation control and how it plays out. With regard to Taiwan, you know, I talked about uh, history in the 1990s. In the 1990s, Taiwan defense spending was about a third of that of the People's uh, Liberation Army budget. And now it's about 125th. Now, China, with its military uh, assets that it has, it has to think about more than Taiwan. It's becoming increasingly global. They have to think about India, for instance. So it's not that they can bring to bear uh, all of their military capability against Taiwan, but the numbers have gone uh, decidedly against Taiwan. And Taiwan's ability then to withstand a PLA assault is problematic and increasingly problematic in the absence of a quick US response. And therein is the danger that uh, what will the United States do should China then use military coercion against Taiwan? Uh, 
Are the American people prepared for a conflict with China that could be catastrophic for both sides and would be a life-changing event for this planet? Polling indicates that less than 50% of Americans would support a military intervention into Taiwan. But I don't know whether that would be decisive in, in time of a crisis. The final point I'd make about uh, Taiwan is that at the end of the day, the PLA and the Chinese communist leadership, they know that even though they've got uh, a decisive military advantage, that an invasion of Taiwan would be a very costly expedition, even without the United States involvement. The amount of landing beaches that are available on Taiwan are extraordinarily limited. The Taiwan Strait is very shallow water. So the PLA's advantage against Taiwan for submarine operations is negated. The weather in the Taiwan Strait is never really too good. You've got very small windows of time to launch an amphibious operation. So I could go on, but the military problem is a very significant one. And the likelihood of China then rolling the dice and say, let's go for the full blown invasion, I think at this time still remains very limited. Uh, so important for the United States to continue to give Taiwan a deterrent capability. And I think very important that increasingly like-minded countries like Japan, Australia, European countries, India, that we talk about the Taiwan issue. Never mind the military operational problem, but what would it mean for the world if China were to use coercion to force Taiwan to come back into the mainland umbrella? I think that would have consequences that go far beyond the military domain. And the need for the, the world to be thinking about Taiwan and showing a degree of support for Taiwan will become increasingly important. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for uh, that response. Uh, uh, I would not like to monopolize the conversation, so now I'll uh, bring in uh, uh, my friend uh, Manjit uh, in the dialogue. Uh, Manjit, would like to ask your questions? Yes, I have, I'm going to ask only one question. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Eikenberry. You mentioned that um, uh, you'd mentioned about how the US has moved from um, counterterrorism efforts and now would have to redirect itself into a new kind of, uh, of conflict. So what are the challenges that the US military faces in redirecting its efforts from counterterrorism and counterinsurgency to a peer or near peer uh, competition with major powers, China and maybe Russia? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important uh, question. Manjit, you know, the, uh, the United States military from 2001 until 2014, 2015, uh, it was focused on uh, insert, uh, terrorist cells and groups of insurgents of maybe 10 to 15. And uh, during this period of time, our military lost no tactical battles. In fact, we got used to winning 100 to nothing or 99 to one. During the Cold War, when we were focused on state to state competition and we had a military peer, the Soviet Union, it was understood within our military that uh, winning 51 to 49 might be good enough and that might be the best we could do. And we might be losing a few rounds as well. So there was a kind of, um, a kind of laziness, a kind of uh, hubris that developed within our armed forces that none of our assets that we had uh, that enabled this kind of extraordinary performance in terms of our uh, precision intelligence, our ability to see something and strike it uh, quickly with absolute precision that all the enablers, whether they were in space or ground-based systems or uh, the assumption of complete air superiority, none of those would be challenged. As we've now started to think more about state to state competition, we've had to go back 
to a lot of basics. One is, Manjit, the need for resilience. So it's interesting, uh, when, I went to, um, when I went to Pearl Harbor and took a group of uh, Stanford professors there, which I've done over the last uh, uh, five years, say five years ago, when I'd go to Pearl Harbor and talk to a, a US Navy destroyer commander, and you'd say, ask the question, well, you go to the South China Sea, are you concerned about China's ability to threaten your enabling systems, cyber attacks, space system attacks? And the answer was yes. What do you do? Well, we go out in an exercise and uh, then we practice this and we shut some of our systems down, but about 12 hours into the exercise, the umpires and the commanders say, turn everything back on, this is too hard and we're wasting too much money. Uh, where this big high-speed exercise we had planned. Last year, when I went to Pearl Harbor, I asked the question, what do you do? And said, what we do is we leave Pearl Harbor 24 hours out on the way to the South China Sea. We shut down our tier one systems. Then 24 hours later, we shut down our tier two systems. 24 hours later, we shut everything down and we're navigating by the stars like Lord Horatio Nelson did. So resilience is important. And I've seen that within our Army, our Air Force, our Navy and Marines. They really are practicing resilience. Point number two is the need to distribute our forces better. That we can't have these single points of failure because China can locate them and they can attack them. So you're seeing some very, very innovative doctrine being developed by all of our forces and in combination our joint forces where we're trying to take small sets of tailored forces and distribute them into say the Western Pacific in places that the PLA would find it, uh, would have a hard time finding and locating them and would also have sets of capabilities that could flip this and actually threaten then China's increasing reliance on enabling systems. Third and final is that the United States military and our civilian leadership are thinking much more now about long range precision strike that the previous doctrine developed during the Cold War and then that you saw played out in Kuwait in uh, the first and second Gulf War, the idea of the United States uh, when faced with a, a potential military adversary would build up uh, at leisure uh, at the doorstep of the adversary and then at a time of our choosing as we use the military parlance, kick the door open. That's not possible with China. China has a very sophisticated anti-excess aerial denial strategy and capability. And so the idea then, if China is coming out into the Western Pacific, it's extending its own forces in the United States for more distance than able to strike at uh, adversary targets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will now invite uh, Jyoti Malhotra, uh, National and Strategic Affairs Editor of The Print, a media partner, to ask a question. Jyoti? Let me see also if I can get this video working. Okay. Yeah, it's working fine. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Kanta. Um, Ambassador Eikenberry, lovely to, to hear your presentation here in Delhi. We know you, of course, when you were ambassador in Afghanistan, and that's how we follow you and know your name. But your, um, my, my question on China is, is much more sort of limited to the Indian theater. And you know that, that there has been an, you know, Chinese aggression in, into Ladakh. It's more than five months now. And uh, Indian troops and Chinese troops are face to face, if not eyeball to eyeball in, in several parts of, of um, along the line of actual control there inside Indian territory. Now the question is, what is the thinking in China? Why is it that um, Xi Jinping uh, has undertaken this, um, this maneuver, if you like, or this aggression into India at this point? Do you think that it's Xi Jinping who, who has, um, who has given permission for something like this and why? Yeah, as to the, uh, as to the question of, was Xi Jinping aware of this? Uh, we don't know, but I think that 
most of the people in U.S. intelligence community uh, that followed these issues would say, yes, he was aware that he's got a very firm grip on the People's Liberation Army, a very strong grip on it. And that's twofold. One is because the military can be a, a source of rivalry for power and uh, Xi Jinping is intent on ensuring absolute Communist Party control uh, with himself at the uh, summit of all facets of Chinese political life and the security elements and the economy. So uh, yes, I, I would wager a good sum of money that uh, he was calling the shots on this. As to the timing of this and why, it, there's speculation that uh, China and the PLA was increasingly concerned by the rise of uh, Indian army and military capabilities, mostly in terms of the improvements of your logistics uh, with uh, airfield capability and also with your ground lines of communication. And that a compelling argument was made to Xi Jinping that in order to, for China to maintain the dominant position in the Ladakh region that, the, uh, that its offensive operations would be required. And to me, the way that China's operated here is very consistent with how it's operated uh, on other security fronts in the past to include your own. We're taking a very bold action, an offensive action, uh, and then uh, putting the opponent back on its heels and then pulling back right after that. But the new status quo that it's established with that action puts them into a better position. The same they did with Vietnam, albeit with a huge cost, the same actions that they take in the South China Sea. Keep pushing, keep pushing. Uh, the other side then uh, steps back and China comes to the negotiating table and say, well, we're just, all we're doing now is trying to maintain the status quo but with each step, they have a new status quo. So I, I look with uh, some alarm to their operations uh, this summer in India. Once again, I think it should be serving as a, a wake up call for like-minded uh, partners and for uh, US allies, because that's the kind of strategy that we'll, I think we'll continue to see not only on your border, but we're going to continue to see employed in the Western Pacific, that's the kind of strategy that will be employed against uh, Taiwan. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have a whole lot of questions in the chat box. Uh, unfortunately, time left is rather short. So uh, with your permission, Ambassador, what we'll do, perhaps we can combine uh, some questions and then request you to, to respond. Uh, so next three persons I'll identify for asking questions. In that order will be Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, uh, Commodore Ranjit Rai, and uh, Mr. P. Rangarajan. Uh, Vishnu, you can start. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ambassador, greetings. If I were a Taiwanese and hearing your uh, remarks, I would be very worried. And if I'm so from the Indo-Pacific region, I'd be concerned. Now, you mentioned that uh, US is strategically distracted and also I think very rightly that in case there is a conflict in Taiwan, uh, whether or not the US public will be ready uh, to be supportive, is uh, there's a question mark over it. Uh, similarly, there seems to be a question mark over the commitment of the US to be a security provider. Uh, we remember in South China Sea, uh, when China uh, took over the Scarborough Shoal in, in 2012, uh, President Obama did not do anything. So what, there is a, a bit of an ambivalence. So what would you suggest to your friends in the Indo-Pacific region or Taiwan? How can they plan long-term and how can they take security decisions when they are not so sure about which way the US policy will evolve? Thank you. Uh, Commander Ranjit Rai would like to ask you a question before we request Ambassador Akinabari to respond. Oh, well, very briefly, I think yeah. I put it on the chat box. Uh, 
Thank you, Ambassador Lieutenant General. You have answered very well, but I want to turn just very briefly to your experience that United States downed Russia, a big military nuclear power, by throttling its economy. Uh, since Ladakh and Doklam, India is spending big on defense. Uh, do you think uh, there is a similar gamble, uh, Chinese are gamblers, uh, by Xi Jinping? to put India's economy under stress with COVID blowing? Uh, third uh, question will be from uh, Mr. Ponthapakkam Rangarajan. Mr. Rangarajan? Yeah, my question, sir. Uh, what will be, um, what do you call, our response? That is the Quad's response. Will it contain PLA? That is one thing. And second uh, second is, sir, you are serving in Tsinghua University. Are you free to speak of your mind? That's my question. Um, sir, could you uh, repeat the first question? I got the one on uh, Tsinghua University. Uh, Mr. Angrajan, can you repeat your first question? He, yes, he sir. wants to know about you know, how, to, how Quad can contain PLA. Yeah. Short question. God, 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 can it contain PLA? That was that was my question, sir. God. Well, Ambassador, back to you. You can respond to the questions now. Okay, Ambassador. So uh, uh, I've got uh, 60 uh, seconds to solve these strategic problems. <laughs> I <all> know. <laughs> they're all great questions, uh, truly. Um, if I could go back to uh, uh, India and China along the uh, your. Um, uh, borders. Uh, one point I would make, it's an interesting one about crises management, that uh, strategically, this is a very difficult problem for India. Uh, in a sense, though, it's true that when these reports of what occurred spill onto the streets, you get a nationalist re reaction. But in one, ex to compare and contrast with the South China Sea, escalation control is a bit easier, I think, on your uh, land border. Why? Because it's remote, you can control media access, and you, you, it's unlikely to get, if you want to control it, uh, unlikely to get vertical and horizontal escalation, you know, remote valleys, remote frontiers. Whereas in the South China Sea, the possibility of this spilling into the media very quickly and getting out of control is high, and the uh, likelihood of horizontal and vertical escalation. That example that I gave where we, the U.S., wants to come in for search and rescue, that brings more forces to bear and it can start to get problematic very quickly. So to address the, uh, the questions about um, Taiwan and uh, U.S. commitment, U.S. commitment to the Indo-Pacific region, as I said, I think that the Trump administration is uh, a bit too, is, can be too maligned for uh, some pretty good work that I think it's done in terms of defense strategy and military strategy in the Indo-Pacific. But the question that the Taiwanese people, the people of Taiwan and Southeast Asia, indeed the broader region has, what's the staying power of the United States of America? And that staying power uh, is, is brought into question by inconsistent messages from Washington, D.C., uh, a economic trajectory that at this point in time is less favorable than China's. And it has to do with uh, just growing Chinese presence. We have the time distance factor. So regardless, diplomatically, economically, in terms of security, one thing that China, China's neighbors know is 100 years from now, China's still going to be on their doorsteps. No matter who's president of the United States, with these kind of trend lines that we see longer term, you are going to be asking the question, is the United States going to be there? My own belief is, and this maybe helps answer the second question, that uh, right now we're in an era where with COVID-19, China... Uh, by good fortune for the Communist Party and uh, good fortune for China, we moved into an area where this pandemic 
where at least for this moment of time, the Chinese model appears to have a lot of benefits to offer compared to rowdy democracies around the world. Um, we also have, for better or worse, a president who has uh, led to allies questioning uh, US support and solidarity with the United States. COVID-19 is gonna go away one day and probably sooner rather than later. And I think that we may have a change in administrations coming up in the United States. Uh, I can't look into a crystal ball and say with any certainty, but I have a degree of confidence that 12 to 18 months from now, it's going to be a very, very different world out there. And China, even domestically, recall that when the COVID-19 first broke out, there was a lot of people asking questions whether this was going to be a death blow to the Communist Party because of their bungling of how they handled it. They stumbled into success, I think. But 18 months from now, the measures that they've taken in terms of increasing repression politically, the steps that they've taken in terms of their economy, ever more status, are these going to flourish uh, when we have a return to more normalcy? I'm not certain about that. Um, and then the last question was about how does the United States uh, compete with uh, regard to the People's Liberation Army? Well, I talked about from a US perspective how I think there's some good work that's going on with some really rethinking of what does military competition look like? What kind of capabilities are needed? What doctrines do you develop? But more important is going to be the ability of the United States to regain its prestige regionally and internationally to be more persuasive that it's there to compete and stay. And then to enlist and create a denser network of allies and partners, not an alliance against China, but uh, where China is competing and where China is aggressive, taking those countries in that particular region or sub-region that are interested in this and not making everything in the world US versus China. But if we're talking say about the South, uh, South Asia, if we're talking about the Indian Ocean, if we're talking about India's concerns with Southeast Asia and its concerns with freedom of navigation, then as we look at the South China Sea problem, not making this something of the US and China, but something that in this instance, Australia, Japan are concerned with, India's showing concerns about this, and even some NATO countries, France with still having territorial possessions in the Pacific interested in this, the United Kingdom, um, perhaps NATO not taking this on as their main mission because that would be inappropriate. Russia is their main concern, but a set of democratic uh, countries in Europe and the transatlantic alliance also talking about this. This is the way to compete with China. China is an expert in singling out an opponent and trying to isolate them. This challenge that the world is facing with China's rise requires a very integrated and comprehensive approach. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we have actually a whole lot of questions in the chat box, but we have absolutely run out of time. So my apologies to colleagues uh, who have raised questions, but I'm unable to, to you know, accommodate those questions. Uh, uh, we hope to continue this conversation with Ambassador Eikenberry. Uh, he has, you know, he has so many things to say about matters of great interest to us, but um, I will now request uh, my, my friend uh, Manjit Kriplani to wrap up uh, and conclude the webinar. Manjit, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Kantha. Uh, you couldn't have said it better. Um, Carl, thank you so much for coming in and uh, showing us uh, the depth and the width of your, of the breadth of your own knowledge um, gleaned over so many years in China. And now that you're back in the US, also understanding your own your own country so well. Um, we really appreciate it. We hope you can, we can have you back because as you said, this is not going away 
And maybe a year from now, you'll come back and we will have a different conversation. So thank you very much. Well, and and you, good. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, there was a question about uh, Tsinghua University. Yes. And very briefly, I'm in the United States right now, I, I would tell you at Tsinghua University in the Schwartzman College program, which is a, a bubble inside of Tsinghua University, uh, you do have uh, guaranteed then access to the uh, internet. Uh, conversations are generally open, but let me put it this way. Uh, uh, one of the Schwartzman master's degree scholar students would not choose as their research project uh, while at the Schwartzman College at Tsinghua University, they would not choose as a research project, a study of the Uyghur Gulag that's been created by China in Xinjiang. So uh, a, a, a great degree of open expression, but uh, certainly there's live wires out there that everyone knows they're there and they generally know not to reach out and uh, touch them. Last, um, I apologize for uh, the remarks being a bit long, not being able to get to the questions. And Ambassador Manjeet, if anybody uh, has a uh, question that uh, they would like to uh, have answered, please send me an email and I'll see if I can uh, get to it. Okay, we'll do, we'll do that for sure. And we look forward to hosting you again. Uh, Ambassador Kantha, thank you so much for co-hosting with us. Um, you know, we admire ICS and we're really delighted to have you as a partner. So thank you. And thank you, Jyoti, also to the print. Thank you very much.